Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, my name is Hawa Khalil. Welcome to another Kutba session of the, the Tahara Collective. Um, today we have Imam Mikdad Taufik um, to give us our um, Friday Kutba as we usually do. So um, please send your Q &A, uh, send your questions through the Q&A box so we can answer to them after the Kutba. Um, I'll just pass it on to Imam Migdad to start the khutbah. Thank you. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim wa bihi nasta'in. Inna alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tabi'ina lahum bi ihsan ila yawm al-deen. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن نبينا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم عبد الله ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I start by thanking Allah for the gift of life I thank Allah for the gift of good health I thank Allah for everything that he has done for everything he is doing and for everything that he will do. I thank Allah for his faithfulness. I thank Allah for his constancy, that even when we derail, Allah remains constant and he's always faithful. I thank Allah for his mercy. I thank Allah for his goodness. I thank Allah because he is Allah and there is no like unto him. I beseech Allah to bestow his countless peace and blessings upon the soul of our teacher, Muhammad al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and upon his household. May the peace and blessings of Allah be with you their uh, brothers and sisters, their viewers, uh, today as we go to the Juma um, uh, Khutbah uh, for today. I want to start by appreciating uh, Tahara Collective for having a student like me on board. I really appreciate you and I pray that Allah, I pray for you, that Allah will accept the little effort we're making in his way as worthy in his sight. You know why? Because nothing is good except what Allah has accepted. What happens if we do it and Allah says he doesn't want it? What happens if we are not sincere with what we do? What happens if shaitan has crept into our hearts and, and you know, and um, kind of sowing a seed of uh, pride or riya or what have you in our heart? What happens if all this has happened to us and unknown to us? We pray, we pray Allah in his mercy that all that we are doing and we will do will be sincerely dedicated for Allah and Allah alone. I ask Allah to bless us all and give us his mercy. Today we shall be going to Surat Toha to get an experience, uh, some glimpses from the Odysseys of Bilahi Musa alayhi salatu salam as Moses. And it's an interesting experience of Moses in getting to know Allah. And I want to use it as a connecting point for us all to leverage on this and then use it as, me, as a means through which we all can navigate and through in our way, in our search to get into know who our creator is, and then we can know how to worship him the best way. My prayer is Allah in his mercy, accept us as true servants of his, purify intention as we try to worship him and count us amongst those whom he will bless in this world and grant us Jannah in the after all. So on that, I want us to go to Surah al -Toha, Quran chapter 20, and we're gonna start it from verse nine. So if you have your Quran with you, please turn with me to Surah al Toha, chapter 20, from verse 9. Allah says, and I quote, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahir rahman rahim Wa hal ataka hadithu Musa id ro'a nara fa qawla li ahlihim kuthu inni anastu nara la alli atikum minha bikobas aw ajidu ala nari wudha And that the case here is a case of Nabi Lahi Musa alayhi salatu salam, when Allah was asking the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, has the news got to you? 
al Ataka. Hadith to Musa, has the news of Moses got to you? Have you received the news uh, about Moses? What happened to him? Verse 10, Allah says, Idra'a naro, when he saw the fire, and when he saw the fire, he, he could see that he was with his family and he was traveling through uh, what we can call late, late evening when it was getting dark. And um, Moses traveling with his family saw that there was a burning fire ahead. Now as a traveler through the desert, you have the problem of being able to see everywhere is dark. Number two, you have the problem of knowing the way. Number three, you have the problem of cold. So you need some, some, some kind of warmth. So when Moses saw the fire, he felt, oh, this is what it is, uh, this is solid. So they can just get to the people with the fire. Of course, we know that without someone, and it's logic, right, that someone would have prepared the fire. Someone would have prepared it. So his intention was to go to the people who prepared the fire, excuse me, and ask them to give him some brand of fire and then he can use that for his family, right? And then you can take it as some warmth and then you can get some information from them. Now, one thing I want us to learn from this experience to start with is that from the physical, we get to know the spiritual. From what we can see, we get to know that there is a power that we cannot see. And this was the example of Moses alayhi salatu salam, that he was able to understand that the fire cannot burn by itself. Someone must have prepared it. So he told his family in Kuthu, you stay here. I could see the fire ahead of me. Then I'm going to go to those who prepare the fire. I will ask them, I will ask them, I will ask them, I'm going to get you some brand of fire or I'm going to get some news on how we can go through the next day. You know, it's getting dark. We're going to just stay here. And that was the intention of Moses. So Moses saw um, uh, uh, the physical light. And the, the, the physical light, which he intended through it, that he's going to see, uh, have an idea of getting an information about their journey. He was traveling with his family. Then um, with this, we know that what he saw provoked him to getting better information. Now, my question is to you, my dear listeners, my brothers and sisters, what are you getting out of what you see. Are you getting information? Are you getting the right information? If you are not informed, then you can't do things the right way. Now, people talk about some things, you know, we live in an information age. And you need to know in the know. I mean, you need to know, you, you need to be in the flow. Or is it the, the other way around now? You need to be in the know in order to be in the flow, right? You need to know exactly what is happening around you. And I want to use this to appeal to us. What kind of information are you getting? Look at Moses. He, he got the right information. He knew he was traveling in the night. He got the fire. So okay, fine. I need some information. I need the I need the warmth. I need world. I need someone to tell me the next direction. I'm going to Egypt, and this was the information. Now we have the we are in, in an internet age. Now are you on the internet to so just to post? And what benefit is it giving to you? You know, you you spend all your data downloading videos and you know, wasting time away. That's what you do, two, four, seven. You're not even benefiting the dean. And that's why I need to thank the Tahara Collective for using this avenue when people are busy on, you know, online doing nothing, just posting and posting and posting. This is an avenue for us to benefit what will be of use to our, our, our hereafter. This is very critical to our learning. So Musa was able to get the direction, you know, he was able to get, I mean, at least he has an understanding that with, by getting in touch with those who are the fire, we'll be able to have an, an idea of in al Huda, that is the direction through which they can continue, with which they can continue with their journey the next day. Now let's continue um, when we get to the next verse and it says that Allah is asking uh, Musa, uh, when he got there, Allah was asking him, in verse uh, 11 now. Yes, verse 11. Falamma ataha nudiya ya Musa, inni anorabbuk 
fakla na alayk innaka bil wadil muqaddasi tuwal when moses got there now keep in mind that what moses was looking for was fire that he would use for his family members that one that his family just immediate family would use to see themselves to get some warmth only for personal use but through that allah gave him the divine light that will illuminate the darkness or the darknesses in uh, amongst the bani israel at that point in time now what lesson can we derive from here that from the ordinary allah can bring the extraordinary what musa saw was the just an ordinary fire a burning flame right now he was looking at it from afar he had not gotten close but when he got close he got something that shocked him he discovered that the fire was burning on green leaf he looked at the freshness of the leaf he looked at the fire burning it was a, it was a contrast right the fire is supposed to burn down the leaf but the fire didn't burn the leaf but the fire was burning right on the green leaf so the, the, the leaf still remains green but the fire was burning amazing right when he got this wow what kind of a fire is this and number two is when he got there he didn't see anybody keep in mind that i said that musa wanted the one that he will use the fire for his personal use and when he got there he got an information that was beyond a personal need and what was it falamma ataha when he got there nodia nodia ya musa it was called now it was a valley he was right now when he got there he was expecting to only get um some fire get information on how to get the, the road to, to egypt the next day and behold they heard his name from all over the valley as in the voice was coming moses moses all over the from all over the valley and that amazed him number one he knew that he was a stranger in that environment number two it wasn't in an area that he was used to so he wasn't expecting anybody to know him out be it know his name there right so he was he heard his name from all over the valley and that shocked him again first seeing the fire burning on green leaf amazing heard his name from all over the valley not from one that particular direction that was amazing then allah said to him inni ana rabbuk fakhla'na alayk innaka bil wadil muqaddasi tuwa i am your lord inni ana rabbuk i am your lord fakhla'na alayk remove your shoes pull up pull off your shoes pull off your shoes because you are in bil wadil muqaddasi tuwa you are in al wadil muqaddas a, a, a holy prison prison i mean in a valley that is cleansed and holy al muqaddas here in a holy valley now he was told that he was in a divine he was having the divine the presence of yeah, kind of a, a presence of um we don't want to say the presence of allah here but he was having an awareness of the presence of allah because allah's presence is manifest all over the places now let's take a lesson from here moses was told to pull off to pull off his shoes now scholars have explained these you know as um, a direct expression that he was actually told to remove his shoes number one number two scholars opine that it wasn't his real shoe because we don't need to remove our shoes when we have to pray it's not mandatory that we remove our shoes when we have to pray and number three some people have opined that maybe the skin of the shoe was made from something haram but i don't think any he could have worn this kind of shoe at that point in time however let's leave that aside the lesson here is this moses was asked to pull his shoes for him to be able to stand in a last presence now many of us are wearing the shoes today so it makes us to be unfit to stand in the presence of our creator to worship him now you might you might be thinking what kind of shoes are we talking about here yes we all have the shoes that shoes of arrogance we wear the shoe of jealousy 
We wear the shoe of envy, covetousness, hatred, enmity. We wear these kind of shoes. So we need to pull the shoes, remove the shoes that will block you, you know, I mean, act as a barrier between you and your creator. We need to remove the, the shoes of personal desire, personal opinion, can't you see me? I am important. This kind of a thing will block your views, will make you to be able to get your direction to your creator. Because if you wear these shoes, then you cannot get through your ibadah. A lot of us go into salat with arrogant mind. A lot of us go into salat when you are asked to pray, for example, you're praying in the masjid where you don't know anybody and stuff like this, and you have to pray besides some brothers, and you know, and you look right to the left, these guys are not like class, you know. I don't think I should be praying here. I think this kind of environment is not even good for me. Right? I think I shouldn't come here to pray again. I think I should go to masjid where we have some friends I can I can just hey, are you in the masjid because of your friends? Are you in your in the masjid because of your class? Oh, I want to go to the masjid that fits my class. This masjid, it doesn't fit my class. Are you going to worship Allah? Are you prepared to, to bring down yourself, to lower yourself and remove that shoes, from those shoes? So if you wear this kind of shoe, these kind of shoes, then you can stand in the presence of Allah and worship him. It's a lesson here. You must remove that shoe that can constipate your growth that can act as a barrier between you and your creator. Because if you put on that shoe, then you can't worship on that. Quite a, like I said, quite a number of people wear these shoes today. So Allah told him, remove your shoes because in because you are in his presence. Now, Standing in the presence of Allah in a state of admittance. It is a state of submission. A time and a state and a, a moment when you are supposed to stand with true and total submission to his will. Now, standing in total submission to his will means that at a time and a place where there is only one rule, one rule. And that rule is the rule of la ilaha illallah that nothing exists except Allah. Nothing can be except the power of Allah. And this, this one, if you are not able to achieve this, then you can be fit to stand in his presence. Because there can't be two captains in a ship. There can't be two bosses in an establishment. You have to you know, submit to the will of your creator. You can't expect that you see yourself as an entity, as an important person, and then you want to worship Allah the, the most high degree. Now, you must surrender. You must submit to his presence before you can be fit to stand uh, 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 in his presence to worship him. Now, it is after having purged yourself of those carnal desires that you can be chosen for the greater assignment in life. When I say greater assignment, the assignment of leading people to Allah. And I want to quickly mention here that I, every Muslim is a da'iyah to the way of Allah. Every Muslim should lead people to Allah. Every Muslim should direct people to Allah. It is not the work of some people that we, like we, that we have been made to believe that some people are supposed to do it. It is everybody's business. Once you have known, Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, anni wa lo ayah, convey on my behalf even if it is only one ayah. With this, we got to understand that it is your duty, it is my duty. However, we all need to be qualified to stand in his presence. Now, when Allah told him this, let's go to the next verse now, and that is in verse 13. That's why in Surah Taha, chapter 20, now going forward from verse 13, Allah says, I have chosen you so listen to what I have to say. Here Allah is telling Moses that, Allah was telling him that I have chosen you. And now listen to what I have to say. Now, if you have to stand in his presence, you must be, you must be chosen by him. Being chosen by him could be by his guidance, 
could be because of the efforts you have made at getting closer to Allah. Whichever way, I ask Allah to choose us uh, with his guidance, with his mercy, so that we can be channels through which people can get to know him. So Allah says, the message is this, in nani Allah, la ilaha illa ana fa'budni wa akimi salata li dhikri. Verily, I am Allah. There is no deity but me. Fa'budni, worship me, wa akimi salata li dhikri, and establish regular salat, regular prayers for my remembrance. Now, this is important. Because the greatest asset that we can have in our lives is faith in Allah. Innani Allah, la ilaha illa ana. To believe that there is none but Allah. Good things come your way, Allah knows. It's the rahmah of Allah. The undesirable happens to you, Allah knows. He knows the best about it. You succeed or you fail, Allah knows. You, you submit to Allah no matter the condition you might be going through. Knowing that without Allah, nothing exists. Knowing that he is a force without beginning, he is the perpetual without an end, he is the independent who does not need anybody or associate or assistance from, from anybody, from anyone. Whatever he gives to you, nobody can take it away. And whatever he takes away from you, nobody can restore it back to you. He protects all. And he is not in need of, of protection from anybody. He preserves all. He is not in need of any care from anybody. His power is irresistible. His supremacy is unchallengeable. His decision is unquestionable. Yet, he is the most forgiving, most forgiving and the most merciful. He has no time in the morning. He has no time in the afternoon. He has no time in the evening. He is Allah and beside him, there is nothing else. This is the greatest asset that we have in our lives as Muslims. My dear brothers and sisters, dear viewers, I want us to understand that this message is the message of the Anbiya, the message of the Prophet of Allah. And we need to understand it and live by it that way. We need to understand it and live with it this way in order that we might get our directions right. Many people in the world today, they claim to be Muslims only on their lips. And when the chiefs are down, I mean, when they are challenged, when their iman is challenged or troubled, when they face challenges and marital challenges at the workplace, what have you, health-wise, they look onto all the being apart from Allah. It is because of an issue, they never understood their creator. And Rasulullah Muhammad wasalam, told us in the Hadith al Qudsi that you must know me before you can worship me. You must have a true knowledge of Allah before you can worship Allah. Because if you don't know Allah, you won't be able to worship Allah the right way. So the important lesson in here uh, today is that before you, you get ahead with your ibadah, you must be able to understand who is my creator. And I ask you, my, my dear brothers and sisters, dear viewers, you are Muslim, why? Whom, whom do you worship? You know, remember that I told you earlier in some of one of our previous lectures that Look, Allah is Allah, and we don't know. We, we, you can't have a comprehensive knowledge of God Almighty. We call him Allah, others call him God, others call him Chineke. We don't have a complete understanding of him except what he reveals of himself to us. So you can't, you can't be chauvinistic or parochial in your approach to Allah because he is Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the cosmos, the Lord of the worlds. So you need to understand his almightiness in order that whenever you approach him in worship, you know you are before the creator of the heavens and the earth, and so you must be humble. You see, a lot of us are, we try to look at, you know, we take things away from the realm of, um, from the realm of uh, corporeality, right? And we tend to launch it into the realm of spirituality. How do I mean? We look at things that we can't do as humans. So we can't do it, so we feel, since we can't do this, Allah can't do it. Since we can, well, nobody has ever tried this. These things can't work here. I don't think anybody has ever done it before. So it can work, it's impossible. No. You need to look at it that, like Rasulullah told us, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. That is not how. How means a scheme, a device. You know, you know the kind of a knowledge that you have, wa la and that is no power, except with Allah. 
So everything and anything you want, just figure your mind on, on a lot. And number two is that, you see, this is a problem with many people, and Alhamdulillah, we're Muslims. Many people who claim to have faith in Allah, we tend to, and this is shaitan, we tend to have put a question mark. Are you really sure God is there? <laughs> you know, we ask this question, but I never saw him. And I tell you, you have seen him already, but you don't know you have seen him. How do I mean? Have you seen the sun that shines? I mean, the sun that shines every day, the moon of the night, the day and the night alternate. Can all this make themselves? Okay, have you seen yourself? Yourself, yeah. Have you seen yourself? Your eyes, your ears, your nose, your what have you? Who made all this? Did you make it? No, you didn't make it. Okay, ask the question, who made me? Definitely, you know that you are not your own benefactor, that you, you are not your own creator. You can't make, if any, may Allah protect us, if any part of anybody's body, anybody's part of the body is amiss, you can't have a replacement. There is no manufacturing plant where you can have a spare part, then you can just replace it. Albeit, we don't have people who manufacture human body. So that means that you must have been made by someone. But it is from what you see that you can decipher and understand that there is a power that you cannot see. Therefore, you will, when you, with this reality, you will submit to the creator of the heavens and the earth. And you should do that. So if you're a Muslim, you should know that. And that thanks, thanks to Allah for guiding us in the way of Islam. And I say this with all sense of humility, because we would not have been guided if, if not Allah had guided us. And what I'm saying this is that of all the din of the religions of the world, Islam is free of anthropomorphism. The anthropomorphism because uh, many people who practice faith or religion, they tend to look at God from the perspective of humans. They tend to put that, okay, let's have, let's have a picture of God. Everybody wants to describe God in their own way. God is black, God is white, God is yellow, God is a human being, God is an animal, God is this. Many din, many religions in the world describe God this way. But Islam does not have any description of Allah. That's, it's a God is like human being. No. Pull who Allah had. God is one and only Allah who summoned. God is the one who is eternally independent of all. Lam yalit wa lam yulad. He begets not. He was not begotten by anybody. He didn't have parents. He didn't have children. So no, this is or no, he didn't originate from someone and nobody originated from him. Wa lam yakullahu ufwan ahad. And that is known like unto him. So with this, we got to understand that only Allah is the Almighty. And we should submit unto him. And that's the point here that Allah was telling Moses, alayhi salatu wasalam, and I put this as, 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 a, as, as a request before us that we should know that innani anallahu la ilaha illa ana. We should know, be convinced that there is one whom we cannot see that made the world that we can see. And there is no doubt about this. If you still have doubts in your mind, maybe during the interactive session, we can have interaction around this. But the point is that you do not have any reason, I mean, any reason to doubt your creator, you know, you, you, the Lord of the world who has made you, because you never could have made yourself. Now, going forward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Moses that I am the Lord, there is no doubt about me, and he therefore says, for good me. So worship me. You see that knowledge comes before the ibadah, right? Before you can worship Allah, you must have a knowledge of, of Allah. So Moses was asked to know him before the ibadah. And that's my, my, appeal, my, my, my appeal to you, my brothers and sisters. You need to have knowledge of Allah. Who is my Lord? Abraham asked this question. So we should ask the question, who is my Lord? And with the true guidance, Allah directed him that your Lord is not like anything or anybody that you see. Some people say, I had a dream. I had a dream and I saw God in my dream. That which you saw is not God Almighty. It's not Allah. Because your head cannot capture the, the almightiness of the, of the creator. You can't encompass. You can't encompass his almightiness because it's, it's beyond the entire universe. Right? But out of his mercy, he gives us this access, an avenue to connect directly with him. And this is the beauty. You do not worship God 
you know, through a kind of an opaque body. You, you don't worship God through an intermediary, right? You worship, you don't worship God through someone. You don't worship God through a prophet or through, through Muhammad. You don't worship God through Jesus. You don't worship God through Abraham or anyone. You worship God directly is a fa'budni. The wa'akim is salata, the dhikri. Now, Allah separate between fa'budni and wa'akim is salata, which means that ibadah is actually the essence of life. Everything that you do in your entire life is worship. But here Allah brings out salat. Why? The dhikri for my, remind, for my remembrance, right? Now, why salat is being uh, 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 um, separated here from Ibadah is because Salah is like a regular connector that we have with our creator. Like your battery is low in your, in your smartphone, you recharge. So we recharge ourselves daily, five times in a day, by reconnecting ourselves to the creator. Some people have said, why, why don't we just do it in our own way? No, you can't do through Ibadah your own way. You can only worship God the way God wants you to worship him. So worship is by revelation. If it is left to human uh, uh, decision, then someone can sit down in his comfort zone and say, well, as I'm eating, I'm worshiping God. But it doesn't go that way. So I like to Moses, Salat and establish regular prayer for my remembrance. Now with this um, experience, we, we, we now understand that life is all about understanding faith in Allah. Because for example, what is faith anyway? Faith is as an, as an affirmative mental attitude which believes that there is nothing that Allah cannot do, that there is nothing that God can't do. Now with this, we have this the, 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 the right to stand in his presence. With this, we have the right to go ahead in his worship and be able to be the best of what we can we can be. Now, like going forward, let's go to, there's a lesson I want us to get in, um, in verse 17 now, yeah. Let's go to verse 17. In verse 17 of the same surah, chapter 20, verse 17, Allah says, Verse 18, he says, Verse 18, he says, Allah, is ask, Allah was asking Moses, Allah said, What is it in your hand? What is it in your right hand, O Moses? And um, he said, it is my stick. And he went ahead and said, Sometimes I lean on it. And sometimes I use it to block my sheep. And I do other stuff with it. And, I use it for so many things. Recall now that Musa was having a direct conversation with Allah, right? So he, he, he couldn't see Allah, but he was hearing, like you hear me, he was hearing Allah, and you know whatever he says, he has a reply. Uh, Allahu Akbar. Now, when Allah asked Moses, what is it that is in your hand? Now, somehow, Somehow, you don't understand a true discovery of our potential. I ask you, my brothers, I ask you, my sisters, what is it that you have in your hands? Yes, I ask you, what do you have? What capacity? What you have the potential? Yeah, potential side in you. Unless you begin to use what you have, you can't really, you can't really appreciate it. So I ask you, what exactly do you have? Somehow, we tend to limit ourselves to our certificates in the university. I'm a medical doctor, so I have to be a medical doctor. I, I studied medicine, right? I have to be a medical doctor, I'm an accountant. Uh, I have to, I studied accountancy, so I have to be an accountant. Well, somehow that is what the university education has made out of us. But you, what about you? Matil can be Yaminika Yamusa. What do you have? Next question is, what are you doing with what, with what you have? Being able to discover yourself, a true discovery of yourself, set no limit to your life. Your certificates, your what of your quality, your academic qualification can be there and it can set a limit, yeah. 
that's going to limit you to what you can do. And people tend to limit you because of so he is this and you know let me go click make a joke here. You know I I went for a course and um, actually I read Islamic studies at the university and um, um, I we had to do some other stuff on the course outside the frame just to get higher education in other areas and. Um, when we were, we, were, we were being asked, who are you? I said, I saw Islamic studies, I'm an imam. And some people who are, you know, who are bound with this, who are stereotypical in their, in their, in their assessment, you know, they look at you as, I saw Islamic studies, like, these guys can't do anything here. <laughs> and uh, I just, I, I, I chuckled and I just kept doing it. So when it was time for us to do the real thing that we got to do there, you know, we had, been through the training and it's time for everybody to begin to, you know, to articulate and exactly tell us what you've learned for this, your degree, the higher degree you've come to acquire in this institution and stuff like this. So, wow. So he said, guys, it's just you guys, it's guys, it's guy and I'm mom. I said, no, don't limit yourself because of your quote, quote unquote university qualification. And if people try to limit you, don't accept that limitation. Don't set a limit for yourself. Don't allow people to set limit for you. And I want to appeal to you, if you live in an environment where people are stereotypical about you, just leave it aside. Don't allow yourself to be boxed to the corner on account of what they say about you. Because whatever they say about you doesn't make you. Don't allow people to cow you down and make you to look as unimportant. Whatever role your life you is, you know, like, like, let us take it away from the realm of money. And I know in this country where people, many people, how like we have this problem of poverty, many people tend to look at everything from the, from the perspective of Naira and Kobo. What can, what money can you make out of this? But hey, hey, give me a break here, yeah, man. Are you telling me I'm a worshiper of money? No way. I don't worship money. I worship my creator. So my life is not because of money. Whatever I do is not because of money that I got to make. I do it because that is my pattern in life. And you need to understand yourself. Martin can be a mean Who are you? You're telling me you go to university because, okay, fine. Which, 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 um, how do you say it now? Which cost is going to give me more money? <laughs> You're wrong, my brother. The, your university certificates may not give you the money, except Allah gives you, except Allah opens the way for you. You may not have anything out of the certificate. And of course, beyond the certificate, what about the certificates? Get me right? Beyond the certificate, what about the certificate? Certificate means you. What do you have? You know, to use the the the, the, the Kuluga expression there, sabi. You, know, you say you sabi, that's your sabi ticket. What did you sabi? That's your sabi ticket. Certificate, that is what the university gives you. So don't allow people to set limit for you. And if you live in an environment, you know, some, some environment and establishment, they are so myop, they are so myopic. And they tend to be a, a, a little bit um, parochial, you know. You know, they tend to look at it as, this one is, no, 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 this can't do this. It can't, can't, can't. Hey. No way, man, no way. That you can't, no, you can. In your own way, you can. So don't limit yourself. So let's go back to the ayah. Allah asked Moses, and I'm going to conclude on this note today. My brother, my sister, what do you have? What exactly do you have? What do you have? Look, success in life is an intersection, an intersection of two things. The intersection of your values and your ideas. When you bring the two together, what are your values? I think, what do you have to offer? Then what idea do you have in, 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 in promoting this thing, in bringing it into the world space? That's what you have. And I want to, like I said earlier, please take it away from, I'm looking for money. Did you lose money? You lost any money? Why are you looking for money? Why is it everything about your life is money, 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 money? No, no way. It doesn't work out that way. Look for success in life. Make your mark before you leave. Because whether you have the money or what, buy the cars, build the houses, or what have you, you will leave one day. So what mark do you want to make in history? 
I ask you, how many houses did Rasulullah Muhammad وسلم, how many houses did they build? How many houses did Jesus Christ build? And I know no thanks today to those of you who live this kind of flamboyant life that, oh, for you to know you are close to God, you must see his blessing here. That is, this is a prosperity pressure. Keep in mind, I'm not talking about not being prosperous. What I'm saying is that go beyond the narrative. This money, money thing. So now Moses, on the final note, before we give him for the questions that they may come, on the final note, Moses said, and that's what most of us do. You know what Moses said? He said, he's my, he's my rod. Now the question, didn't Allah know what Moses was holding? So why was he asking Moses? Yes. He was asking Moses because he, Allah wanted Moses to look beyond the stake. That there is more to what you think you have than you're making the use of it, right? So you need to get beyond, get out, get out of, get out of your cocoon, get out of that cocoon that limits you. Don't waste that opportunity that Allah has given to you. Do not waste it away, because you are more than that thing I'm looking at. There is something in you that is expected to make a mark in the world space. Whichever your own world view, whichever your world is, I'm not saying travel to America. This is your world. That's your world. Your environment. That's your world. What impact are you making in it? So Moses said, "It's my stick. I use it for this. I use it for that." Guess what? Allah says, "Hola, al kihaya Musa." So Allah wanted Moses to understand that that is beyond um, um, using it for flocking his sheep, uh, using it to rest, uh, using it to get grasses and all this. There is something in that stick that Moses never understood. So Allah wanted him to understand. In the same vein, my brothers and my sisters, as we wrap up this session today, there is something about you that Allah wants you to understand. So stop, stop, just stop. And go beyond the apparent. Get to the real person behind your personality. Who are you? What do you have? What are you doing with what you claim you have? Have you gotten a true discovery of yourself? Do you know yourself? Are you making a good use of yourself? Are you looking for money? Are you working for money? Are you working for fame or position? Then you got it wrong. Money, fame, position, power, all this will come if Allah had the sign, it will come. And if Allah had the sign, it won't come, you don't need it. Let me make this point clear. What you have been given, Allah knows you need those things. What you have not been given, you don't need it. So worry less. Do not kill yourself with worry habit. Maybe sometimes you are talking about worry habit. If I'm privileged to be invited by the Hara Collective, we shall now. Because a lot of us kill ourselves with worry habit, worry over nothing. I don't have these, I don't have that head. Give me a break, my brother. You got Allah, you got everything. I ask Allah in his mercy to bless you all and give us all his mercy in this dunya and akhirah. I ask Allah to give us his goodness and mercy, his protection you know, in our environment, in our society, so that we can get the best out of our souls, out of our lives, and become the best we can ever, ever aspire to be. We're going to stop here for uh, comment, question, and um, that we might, or contribution, as it were, that we may have. I, once again, I want to thank the Hara Collective for giving me the privilege of addressing this August, um, August presence of my brothers and sisters. And I want to thank you for um, uh, being there. I ask the line of mercy to bless you all and give us all the success that we desire in this world and we have. On that note, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Thank you so much for that um, very informative khutbah. Um, absolutely enjoyed it. I'm sure people enjoyed it as well. We only have one question currently. Um, someone asks, what's the best askar or zikr for an individual whose shaitan whispers into? Whose shaitan is what? Whispers into. Yes, uh, you, you, it's good. 
أعوذ بالله من همزات الشياطين أعوذ بالله من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بالله أن يحضروا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم كسيدا أعوذ بالله من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بالله أن يحضروا This is okay That is the meaning is you're seeking Allah's protection against a shaitan and it has no limit. Let me quickly mention this. It has no limit. Constantly say it. Anytime, like Allah says, وَإِمَّا يَزَغَنَّا كَمِنَا شَيْطَانُ نَزْ تُفَسْتَا إِذْ بِلَّهِ Anytime shaitan brings some negative whispering to your mind, answer that whispering or those whisperings by remembering Allah. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right. Uh, um, we have another question. Somebody can... Um... This question says, Assalamu alaikum, Jazakumlahu Khairan, Alhamdulillah. I asked um, a question on maintaining kinship with one's junior siblings. If one has strived to follow all the rulings, including being patient, try to make contact with them, but all this does not work. I believe I have forgiven them. I hope not contacting any longer until they are ready to come back will not affect my worshiping Allah in the right manner. Each time I think about their attitude towards me, it's very upsetting and unhealthy for me. Okay, fine. Um, no, no, I think the, be the best thing is um, have an understanding of why they are doing what they're doing. Sometimes their, their actions might be born out of envy, might be born out of spite, might be born out of inability to depart from the past. So if your mind is clear, leave them, but be cautious. Because somebody who has that, ten, uh, people with such tendencies can, can be very destructive, be very destructive. Let your mind be clear of them, okay? But be, be cautious. Uh, 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 it's, it's important for us to know this, but be cautious of the evil. Because some um, topics within human nature will make them who want to do that which is not toward. But once your mind is clear, just leave them, leave them as, they, as they are and focus your life on your team. Once your mind is clear, everything will be clear with time, inshallah. Um, thank you, sir. We have another question. If this one says, Can kindly shed more light on Islam's view on prosperity and wealth. How about wanting to be rich and wealthy so that you can live a good life and contribute towards making life easier for your family, the people around you, and the ummah? Yeah. Number one, you need to understand the story of Quran in certain causes. If you want wealth, ask Allah. But let's keep in mind it's Allah who enriches people. And honestly, you need to know this clearly. It is Allah who enriches people. And whomsoever Allah enriches is a trial. It's a trial for him or a trial for her to see how or what the conduct will be. So if you want to be rich, tell Allah. We tell Ghani. Allah can enrich you. But just keep in mind that you are asking for something that when it comes, ask Allah to give you the ability to withstand the pressure because. Wealth or riches come with a lot of pressure. When you have money, oh my God, except you don't want to, you want to lose your Islam. If you want to keep your Islam, if you ask for money, then ask Allah to give you the mercy of being able to control it so that it doesn't turn out to control. A lot of brothers, um, I, I, I gave a lecture this morning on it's our regular, regular Friday lectures. And, um, interestingly, people who, who Allah has emplaced, people who used to be, Allah has taken them from the grass and Allah has lifted them so high. So after they changed, they felt they are not important until <laughs> Allah brought back the other side of life to them. So, so I, I thought I was special. Because you are not special. Very special. You're just who you are. So being able to remain the way you are is very important. A lot of people miss their way. A Muslim, for me, 
I, I think, well, I might be wrong. My understanding is don't ask for money. Ask for mercy from Allah. Allah knows what you need more than you. But if you think you need riches and money, ask al Ghani, the Lord who blesses people with wealth, and he will give it to you. But keep in mind, if you want your deen, your Islam, then be wary of asking for riches of this world. Because it can actually mislead you. And Allah knows best. Thank you, sir. Um, we have another question. This says, Salam, sir. Can you please speak a bit more on how to prepare oneself for Allah's barakah? Basically, how to purify oneself to be usefully by Allah. To be used for? To be used fully by Allah. To be used fully by Allah. I love this. Yes. And I really, I really love that person. Sorry, I don't know the person who has a question, but I want to tell the brother that has a question that I really love you for the sake of Allah. Because this be is my sister. desire. Say again. Could be a sister, sir. I, well, I still love her for the sake of Allah. Because you know why I'm, why I'm saying this is that for somebody to desire to be useful by Allah, that should be my friend. That should be the, somebody that is so beloved to me. And the reason is, this is my desire in life. My ultimate desire in life is to be used fully by Allah. So I, I, I may wish to know that person, if it's, a, if it's a brother or a sister, honestly, I want to walk with you in the way of Allah. Because I love people who desire Allah because I also desire Allah. And this is my dream. My only dream in life is Allah. And I hope that will be the dream of every Muslim too, inshallah. So what do we do about the person? Can I send your contact to the person? Or please, um, whoever asked the question, should please send an email to taharacollective at gmail.com so that we can link you to Imam Mikdad Taufik and then conversations can go on um, during or when we share your contact. So kindly send us a, um, an email, taharacollective at gmail.com, inshallah. I'll share Imam's contact or you can just send your contact so I can give it to the Imam. Um, our next question says, is there a dua to stop worrying too much about Allah's mercy? I don't understand. To stop what? Is there a dua to stop worrying too much about Allah's mercy? To stop worrying about Allah's mercy? Yes, that's what the question says. Why worry about Allah's mercy? You don't have to worry. If the mercy of Allah is the mercy of Allah. You don't have to because... The mercy, like Lord Allah says, in the heart that in the This is our provision. It will never end. Although the, it, it direct, direct implication of this is in Jannah, but the truth of the matter is that whatever Allah gives, nobody can take it away. So stop worrying about it. If it is Allah's mercy, nobody can take it away. May Allah give us His mercy. I don't know if this is what the person is probably trying to ask, but I mean. For me, sometimes I probably worry, okay, am I doing the right thing? Is Allah merciful to me? I, I, I don't mean is Allah, of course, Allah is merciful to me. Is Allah happy with me? Like, because we can't know for sure, we can only strive to do the little that we can. But there's always this question in the back of our minds. I don't know if it happens to people, but sometimes I just wonder, am I doing the right thing? Is Allah happy with me? I hope I'm not like doing things to get Allah's worth. Even if we can really not be perfect, we can only try our best and strive to become better. But there's just a constant thought and the constant worry of, am I doing the right thing? Is this what it's supposed to be? So I don't know, maybe that's what the person is trying to ask. It's good, it's good. It's good. You know, Rasulullah Muhammad it says that a believer should be kind of both for Raja. And this is a good state of mind of a Muslim. You should be between in between a, a believer's life should be between hope and fear and in awe of Allah. So it's a good state of mind. If that is what is meant, that you are in the state of awe, that oh, I hope that Allah will accept this. And this is the state of mind of every believer that you should be in the state of awe that because you can't say that ibadah is ibadah unless and until it is accepted by Allah. So nobody can say that I've done it, so Allah must accept it. No, Allah mustn't accept it. But we ask Allah that whatever we are able to do, that Allah will accept it. I mean, I mean, 
Thank you, sir. Um, this next question says, money is important. So can you elaborate on how you mean we shouldn't worry about money? What I mean is, it's not, it shouldn't be your business. If whatever Allah will give to you, he will give. Your business is not, for example, you're worried about what is in the, the design of Allah to give you at X, Y, Z period. What you should do is don't be lazy, do your work, whatever profession or avocation you might be into, do it the best way, that's mine. So as regards wealth or money, I don't want to give personal examples, but I will have given some <laughs> personal examples here. But honestly, with my understanding, I know that will lie. It's only Allah that enriches people. If I tell you how I started life and where Allah has taken me to today, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. So that's why I just ask myself, if Allah can take me from that place to this place, then what am I worried about? Let's just do everything to Allah and work for the day. That's my own. Mm. Don't, worry, don't, don't worry about dunya. Worry about what you worry. Now, let me say this. I think what you worry a Muslim is Allah. Am I pleasing Allah? Is Allah, just like the, the earlier question, is Allah happy with me? Am I doing the right thing? These are the things that you worry a Muslim. Not that it's my account bigger now. Have I built how many houses? <laughs> Wallahi, if those houses will come, those cars, you go tired. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't want to give personal examples, but let's just go on. But my well, advice sir, is, there's, there's, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there's always, there's always the, the need to want to, you know, have increase in, I'll say worldly things. There's always that, that, that fear of, ah, am I might be my best. Like, I mean, I know that in Islam, I, um, we're, supposed to, we're not supposed to look too much at people that are higher than us. Instead, we're supposed to look at people that are below us and in that we give thanks to Allah. But there's always just that urge to, I want to acquire this, I want to acquire that, I want to do this, I want to do that. How can I get this? How can I get that? But if now we're saying that, of course, everything is in Allah's hands. If he hasn't destined you for that money, no matter what you do, you really not get it. But then there's always, just always that human part of us that wants to, Acquire the worldly things in life. I'm happy you said the human part of us, right? Yeah. So why would you listen to the human part of you? Why? Don't listen. The problem we have is that we want to run the race of another person. You want to live another person's life. You want to run another man's race. Hey, live your life. Run mm. your race. One of my sheikh told me that Someone can have money earlier than you, but the person may not have money more than you when, when the time comes. Hmm. Someone can have children earlier than you. When Allah opens the way, Allah can bless you with more children, better hmm. children. Someone can build a house earlier than you. I mean, you built your own house before I built mine. Fine, are you gonna carry your, head, your house to the Jannah? Someone can build a house times two than your own house. So why worry about this? So the, what makes people worry about those things is just the human, the human nature. So don't listen to your human nature. Listen to Allah. So if, okay, like, okay, I want to give some example, but okay, let's just look at it this way. While I was still struggling, and of course I'm still struggling, but while I was still, <laughs> I'm still struggling though, but I was, when I was at a particular cater, and I used to look at people who write cards. I say, ah, can I ever have cards? <laughs> because don't many cards now. And I don't want to sound boastful. I was thinking that, ah, boy, I could think I had that guy in my life, yeah? But today is history. When I was looking at people with houses and I said, ah, can I ever have one? So these are things that will come when Allah wills, they will come. So, but when you live based on human, other people's life, oh, my friends have got these, oh, my time is running out, oh, I think I better get this now, hey, hey. Then certainly you will be worried. Certainly you will be worried. And you become a tool in the hands of Shaitan. Shaitan can whisper into you so many nasty thoughts, like especially making you to want to see your, your, your friends and your whatever. Hey, they have got it. Hey, all of them have got it. Let hey, them get what they will get only what belongs to them, but they can't get what belongs to you. May after Allah will nasa me rahma. Allah says, it's not to fatir. Chapter 35, verses 2 to 3. 
Whatever door of blessing Allah makes to be open for anyone, nobody can close that door. It's time. Wait for a last time. But when I say wait for a last time, many people get it wrong. I'm not saying don't work. I work. I'm not saying don't struggle, don't do a few things. I do. So but do whatever you're supposed to do in a halal way and leave the rest in his hands. And leave the rest in his hands. And it's just the right thing. Thank you so much, Zah. Um, I think we have one more question and then I have a question. This one says, please, what is the, what is the dua for seeking mercy from Allah? The dua for seeking mercy from Allah is just to ask for yeah. his mercy. Ask for his mercy. Ask, Ya Allah, give me your mercy. Ya Allah, give me your mercy. Ask, I will give it to you. Ask Allah for his mercy, he will give it to you. Yeah, maybe what I'm doing, many people like, okay, many people like, and let me correct this impression. You mustn't say your dua in Arabic. You mustn't. Say your dua the way you know how to say it. You record that Rasulullah Muhammad said, when you are in the position of such that, that is the best time you are closer to. That's the, the closest time you can be to Allah. Get closer, be earnest, and get, get sick Allah. Earnestness here is say it not from your lips, but from your heart. So say the dua the best way you can, in your own language, your own understanding. Ask Allah, of course, in line with the sunnah, for the best thing of this dunya and akhirah, and leave the rest in his hands. So that's the best. So I have one question, um, and it's on repentance and forgiveness. What, what, like, what, is, what, what exactly is repentance, and what exactly is seeking forgiveness? Are they the same thing? And like, how do they differ? What's the difference? I don't want to say what I know because instead it gets me more confused. So I'll just leave it to you to answer the question. But what's the difference between doing istighfar and then repentance? Are they different? Is it the same thing? Yeah, they're different. The um, istighfar is to say astaghfirullah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa encourage us to say astaghfar all the time. But we never can tell we offend Allah. Repentance is a state of the mind, like a U-turn, right? Like you're going this direction, you turn away, and then you face the direction. So that is a tauba or inaba. You turn away from a particular path, and you turn back to another path. That is when you repent. That is, you drop what you were on because you knew, you realized that it is bad. Now you choose something different. You do something differently. You can only do that when you have repented. Repented means I have, I'm through with this one. Now I want to start a new life. That's repentance. But it's the part to say is is an everyday life of a Muslim. So Rasulullah asks us and encourages us to say, even he says it's the far not less than 70 times in a day. So I think it is a good thing every time and any time. Part of our dhikr is we should always say astaghfirullah. Oh Allah, please forgive me. But we never can tell what we might have done wrong, unknown to us. So we should always seek for Allah's forgiveness. So is to to get more clarification. So if 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 you realize that okay, this particular sin that you're committing or this thing that you're doing is wrong, and then for one reason or the other, you find yourself back at it. You already had a state of mind when you did it the first time, or you had it like you just thought about it, like, oh, okay, I know that what I'm doing is wrong, but then you'll find yourself doing that same thing. The the istighfar you do, or the asking for Allah's help to overcome that particular sin, is that repentance? And then if you now find yourself back at it again, like is that still repentance? Is Repentance a one-time thing, or it's something you do continuously, continuously, continuously. I understand. I understand. Now, the fact that you have a tendency of going back to that sin, it shows you are not through with it. You need to be determined to be true with it, and it's a very important condition of repentance. Be determined, I'm through with it. Then ask Allah to forgive you. But at the, in the hadith of Abu Huraira, Rasulullah Muhammad, Sallallahu told us that. So long as you continue to go back to Allah, you will always find Allah's forgiveness. It's just that you are not through with that thing you're doing. The sad thing, if I may add, is that if you are not through with what you're doing that is wrong, what happens if death sticks up on you while you 
are still on it. So long as you go back to Allah, you will always find Allah. Yes. But what happens if, if Tawbah is repentance, I'm through with it. As in from your inner self, you're through with it. That is Tawbah. But the Stigfar is constant that if you, you claim you are true with it, you deep repentance, so you feel yourself going back into it, slipping back into it. It feels right inside of you. You aren't true with it. So my appeal is, we should be true with what we're doing that we know it's wrong because death can stick up on us at any time. So we should be conscious of that. But that is not supposed to mean that if you go back to a last of full, Allah will not forgive you. Allah will always forgive you. But what happens, what's going to be your last deed? That like you may not have the opportunity of doing any other thing again. This is an important question that we need to ask. Um, we have a few things that, are, that the members of our audience have said during the course of um, when you were giving responses to questions that were asked. Um, this says, I, I would like to keep them anonymous. This was saying, um, Salaamu Alaikum, it is valid for us to aspire for the good of this world. I think the imam should be sensitive to the honest concerns of the attendees. We're all, in, we're all on different stages of the journeys of our lives. Um, so essentially, this was our person says, so essentially do your work well, seek Allah's face and Baraka, and pray for Baraka. Um, this person says, and another approach could be using the Baraka mindset, which is seeking money or sustenance for, in the hope of fulfilling some of the responsibilities that Allah has charged us with. For instance, one beseeches Allah's blessings in getting a job to fulfill your responsibility to your family and siblings. Um, our members of audience have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for you. This other person says, Alhamdulillah, this has been a very useful kutbah. It connects listeners of different ages, young and not so young. The aspect of not basing one's success on the amount of material wealth is a very personal decision. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you all so much. I think I mean to all the duas that um, the members of the audience have said for you. And I would also, I also add my own dua and say that may Allah continue to grant you more and more and more beneficial knowledge. Well, thank you so much for your time, all the um, interesting and amazing lectures that you've given us. And I'll just ask that you just help us round off with um, a closing dua and then we can call it today. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, we appreciate um, you taking your time to be with us here today. We ask Allah to bless all of us and to ease all our affairs. Jazakumal current everyone. Have a wonderful Juma Juma Mbarak Samaikum Arma Sala Barakatu.